Meine Damen und Herren, herzlich willkommen im Haus der Kulturen der Welt zu dem Projekt Stadt, Religion, Kapitalismus. Zunächst einmal die gute Nachricht, auch in den nächsten Tagen wird es Tickets geben, sodass Sie alle die Chance haben, wieder reinzukommen. Die Tickets für Studenten und Schüler sind natürlich frei. Die Idee zum Projekt wurde letztes Jahr in Gesprächen geboren, die ich zunächst mit Richard Sennett und Alexander Kluge führte. Ihnen möchte ich an dieser Stelle ganz besonders danken für das Engagement und den Ideenreichtum, die Sie in das Projekt mit einbrachten. Beide machten sich das Projekt von Anfang an zu eigen und waren dann eine permanente Inspirationsquelle für die Entwicklung des gesamten Programms. Ein großes Danke an Sie beide. Richard Sennett arbeitet seit längerem mit einer Reihe junger Forscher und Kulturschaffender in dem Projekt Theatrum Mundi zusammen mit denen wir unter anderem die Akademie entwickelten, die wir in den nächsten Tagen parallel zu den Abendveranstaltungen hier durchführen werden. Stellvertretend für alle möchte ich hier insbesondere Adam Kaser danken. Es war eine große Freude, mit euch zusammenzuarbeiten. Kurz nachdem die ersten Ideen zu dem Programm auf dem Tisch waren, begannen sich Thomas Matusek und Ute Weiland von der alfred herrhausen gesellschaft für die Idee zu begeistern. Sie waren nicht nur bereit, das Projekt zu fördern, sondern begleiteten ihrerseits mit Rat und Tat den einjährigen Entwicklungsprozess. Es war von Anfang an eine Kooperation im besten Sinne, in der jeder seine Kenntnisse, Erfahrungen und sein Wissen bezüglich der Themen einbrachte. Auch an Sie beide und an der alfred herrhausen gesellschaft geht mein großer Dank. Durch ihre Unterstützung erhielten, wenn ich so sagen darf, die Ideen Beine. Bedanken möchte ich mich auch bei James Anderson, der die Fellows der Akademie großzügig unterstützt hat. Thank you very much, James Anderson. Nachdem das erste Konzept der Veranstaltung fertig war, suchten wir nach den Intellektuellen, die aus unserer Sicht in der Lage sind, eine eigene Sicht auf die komplexe Materie zu werfen. Ich freue mich sehr, dass Saskia Sassen, Angelika Neuwirth, José Casanova und Josef Vogel unsere Einladung sofort annahmen. Auch an Sie geht mein herzlicher Dank. Erlauben Sie mir noch einige kurze Anmerkungen, wie sich dieses Projekt in der Arbeit des Hauses der Kulturen der Welt verortet. Der Grundgedanke besteht darin, mit Stadt, Religion, Kapitalismus drei Grundsätze bzw. Errungenschaften menschlicher Kultur zu thematisieren. Historisch markieren sie Wendepunkte in der Menschheitsgeschichte. Gleichzeitig lässt sich unsere heutige Gesellschaft ohne sie nicht verstehen. Artikulieren sie doch genau in diesen Feldern die tiefen Umbruchprozesse, denen wir uns heute ausgesetzt sehen. Und ich sehe in ihrer, viel, in ihrer Anwesenheit wo wir alle überrascht sind, wie viele gekommen sind, ein Zeichen dafür, dass genau diese Umbruchprozesse eigentlich uns alle beschäftigen. Dies ist auch der Grund, warum sich das HKW in den letzten Jahren unter verschiedenen Perspektiven immer wieder mit diesen Themen auseinandergesetzt hat. Ich erinnere an in der Wüste der Moderne, dass die Stadtgeschichten westlicher Moderne in kolonialen Praxen verortete. Global Prayers, das die Rückkehr der Religionen in das Erscheinungsbild der Städte analysierte, und schließlich Schuld und Schulden, das die Logiken der Finanzkrise kulturgeschichtlich untersuchte. Gleichzeitig lassen sich diese Wendepunkte als zivilisatorische Schritte zu einer Epoche begreifen, für die, und Alexander Kluge hat es schon erwähnt, von den Wissenschaftlern kürzlich der Begriff des Anthropozäns geprägt wurde. Ein Denkmodell, dessen Implikation in dem dreijährigen Anthropozän-Projekt durch, durch das HKW entfaltet werden. Dabei wurden die drei Grundprinzipien Stadt, Religion, Kapitalismus als Bewusstseinsschichten erkennbar, die wesentlich eine Entwicklung initiierten, in der der Mensch durch seine kulturellen Leistungen eine Kraft und Energie entfaltet, die die Erde als Ganzes verändert. Diese Entwicklung führt zu einer Neubewertung von Kultur- und Naturgeschichte, 
wie auch zur Verortung des Menschen generell. Zum Schluss noch eine kurze Anmerkung zur Struktur der drei Tage. Die Filme von Alexander Kluge weben ein Netz von Geschichten, die die Themen historisch einbetten. Während die jeweils anschließenden Gespräche aus der Perspektive der Diskussionspartner stärker die zeitgenössischen Auseinandersetzungen und diese Themen fokussieren werden. Nachdem wir ca. 50 Minuten hier auf der Bühne gesprochen haben, werden zunächst zwei Teilnehmer aus der Akademie auf das Gespräch als Discussants reagieren. Zum Schluss haben auch Sie noch die Möglichkeit, Fragen zu stellen. Ich wünsche uns alle drei anregende Tage und möchte nun Thomas Matusek auf die Bühne bitten. Meine Damen und Herren, wenn Sie den Film von Alexander Kluge gesehen haben, dann werden Sie vielleicht verstehen, weshalb man mit Begeisterung auf diese Idee dieses Projekts anspringt. Aber Sie werden sich fragen, warum ausgerechnet die alfred Harhausen gesellschaft ausgerechnet ein Think Tank, der der Deutschen Bank gehört. Ich will Ihnen die Antwort geben. Das Stichwort ist Vertrauen. Wir fühlen uns, sehen Sie, bitte. Nein, wir sehen uns in der Tradition Alfred Herrhausens verpflichtet, die Grundfragen unserer Gesellschaft zu diskutieren. Alfred Herrhausen, der vor 25 Jahren ermordet worden ist. Und wissen Sie, mit dem Vertrauen ist das wie mit der Müllabfuhr. Man merkt es erst, wenn es nicht mehr da ist. Und im Jahr 2007, 2008 ist ein Großteil des Vertrauens in unserer Gesellschaft zusammengebrochen, in erster Linie durch die Schuld der Finanzindustrie. Und das kann man konstatieren, man kann aber auch versuchen, was dagegen zu tun. Vertrauen ist der Klebstoff unserer Gesellschaft und wir haben seit zehn Jahren in unserem Projekt Urban Age in Megacities versucht, die verschiedenen Aspekte des Zusammenlebens von Menschen in diesen Riesenstädten zu untersuchen, und wir kamen immer auf Vertrauen. Vertrauen in die Menschen, mit denen man zusammenlebt. Vertrauen in Regelwerke, in Ordnung, in menschengemachte Ordnung, in vorgefundene, vielleicht von Gott gemachte Ordnung, aber vor allen Dingen in das Substrat des Zusammenlebens Kapital. Geld ist Vertrauen, Geld ist materialisiertes Vertrauen. Und wenn das einmal zusammengebrochen ist, dieses Vertrauen, ja, ich bin Ihnen sehr dankbar dafür. Wenn, das, wenn dieses Vertrauen einmal zusammengebrochen ist, ist es sehr schwer, es wiederzugewinnen. Und das kann man nur wieder gewinnen, das Vertrauen in Menschen, indem man sich Gedanken macht und zeigt, was Leadership ist und das Vertrauen, was verloren gegangen ins System, nur indem wir uns Gedanken machen über Governance. Und wenn wir diese drei Tage nutzen, die Anregungen nutzen, die Analyse nutzen, ich glaube, dann können wir einen kleinen Schritt weitergehen auf dem Wege, dieses Vertrauen wiederzugewinnen. Und das ist der Grund, weshalb wir als Alfred Herrhausen Gesellschaft begeistert bei diesem Projekt mitmachen. Ganz herzlichen Dank. Es ist, es ist ein großes Geschenk für dieses Haus und ich glaube für uns alle, diese drei Herren hier heute Abend am Tisch zu haben. Alexander Kluge, David Chipperfield und Richard Sennett. Herzlich willkommen noch einmal.
Chair, it's a great honour indeed, and a great honour for this House to have with us here tonight these three gentlemen, Alexander Kluge, David Chipperfield and Richard Senna. Thanks very much for being with us. Da Sie alle diese drei Herren sehr genau kennen, ich Sie aber gleichzeitig vorstellen muss, habe ich mich dafür entschieden, jeden mit einem Satz zu charakterisieren. Since all of you know these three gentlemen very well indeed, but I still have to introduce them, I've decided to characterize them with one sentence each. Alexander Kluge is der Künstler der 70.000 Jahre Menschheitsgeschichte in sieben Stunden und einen Tag auf über 300 Seiten darstellen kann. Alexander Kluge is the artist who manages to put 70,000 years of the history of mankind into seven hours and one day into more than 300 pages. Äh, zum Letzten vielleicht noch in Klammern, ist ja kein eigener Satz. Er veröffentlicht gerade ein Buch über den letzten Arbeitstag des Dritten Reiches. Uh, to add, just in sort of brackets, because it's not a sentence, he's currently publishing a book about the last working day of the Third Reich. David Chipperfield ist der Architekt, der ein Museum so re restaurieren kann, dass die Wunden der Vergangenheit sichtbar bleiben in einem sonst absolut modernen und zeitgenössischen Gebäude. David Chipperfield is the architect who manages to restore a museum in such a way that the scars of the past remain visible in what is otherwise a modern building. Und Richard Und Richard Sennett lebt und denkt die Stadt so, dass wir unsere Städte für uns immer wieder neu erfinden können. And the way Richard Sennett thinks and lives cities is the way that allows us to keep reinventing our cities for ourselves. Meine erste Frage richtet sich an David Chipperfield. My first question is to David Chipperfield. Sie bauen nicht, sie planen nicht Städte. Was sie bauen sind solitäre Innenstädten. What you are building and planning isn't cities, it is a solitary construct within cities. Gleichwohl beziehen diese Solitäre, diese Gebäude, die sie bauen, natürlich auf die Stadt. And at the same time, these solitary constructs, these buildings, relate to the city. Es gibt ein sehr interessantes Interview mit Renzo Piano in den 90er Jahren, als er den Potsdamer Platz bauen sollte. There's a very interesting interview with Renzo Piano done in the 1990s when he was supposed to build the Potsdamer Platz, the square in Berlin. Und der Schriftsteller, der dieses Interview mit ihm führte, sagte, sie haben ja die ideale Situation für einen Architekten, einen total leeren Platz in der Mitte einer Großstadt. And the author who conducted this interview said to him, what you have is the absolutely ideal situation. You've got a completely empty space, a void, right in the heart of an urban center. So, Sie haben die größte Freiheit, die sich ein Architekt leisten kann. So, that is the greatest freedom that an architect can afford to have. Und die Antwort von Renzo Piano war, das ist das größte Problem. Absolute Freiheit ist Terror. Ich als Architekt brauche einen Rahmen, Bezugspunkte, in der ich meine Freiheit äh, exekutieren kann. And Piano's answer was, that is actually the greatest problem, because absolute freedom is terror. Because one needs as an architect, he said, a framework, points of reference within which to execute one's freedom. Also meine Frage jetzt an David Chipperfield, wenn Sie bauen, gerade in diesen Städten, wie Sie äh, haben Projekte in Shanghai, Mexiko, wie beziehen Sie sich auf das städtische Umfeld? Welche Ansätze, welche konzeptionellen Strategien verfolgen Sie, wenn Sie ein Gebäude in diesen Städten errichten? And my question now to David Chipperfield is, you have projects in Shanghai, Mexico and so on. How do you relate to the urban environment around you? What is your, your concept and your strategy in that? Hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh, <coughs> let me first of all agree with Renzo Piano and understand what he means, but also in a way contradict because I don't think 
I'm not waiting for translation, am I? It's just continuing. Yes. Um, that I don't think that building in Potsdamer Platz was a free site, in that it's em it was empty. But as we've been talking about, as Alexander Kluge and Richard talk about, you know, the idea of the city is more than what's on the ground. So I think, you know, this is something I will talk about a little bit, is the, the, the special condition of building in Berlin, because I think whenever you're building in Berlin, you can't be independent of the idea of city. And this is, I think, one of the problems that we struggle with as architects, because a building in a city only makes sense if it's contributing to the city. Architecture doesn't, um, doesn't work comfortably uh, as an autonomous thing. You know, if, if architecture just sits independent of everything else, then you can only judge it on its form. Um, independent buildings tend uh, not necessarily to be able to um, respond or, or, or strengthen the city. So as architects, I think we all enjoy better when the individual task is within the context of a larger idea. The city is a larger find idea. The, larger idea? <laughs> the city is a larger idea. But the way the mechanism by which we make architecture now makes us more autonomous from that construct. So if you think that <clears throat> historically cities well architecture worked within a city structure in an organic way. You took some buildings down and you built another. You took one building down and you put another one in its place. Therefore, you are, you are respecting the context within which the next generation of buildings happens. We no longer build cities in an organic manner. We build them in a, at another scale. The, the organic dimension is no longer part of commercial development. Therefore, when you build at a larger scale, you really need to be building with vision. And that's what we saw in post-war planning, in a way, utopian ideas of making a city. But we now find ourselves at a time where we are neither building organically, nor with vision, but we're building in what might, might a mode that one might refer to as con convenient. We are building in under a, a, a climate of sort of convenience, that the city uh, is not what Richard Sennett would refer to as, you know, the sort of a mediating machine of conflict. We are, the, the, the possibilities of building now are already somehow tidy. We certainly see that in the Anglo-Saxon world, you know, where the motivation to build a city is now totally com commercial. Investment is the vision. And uh, there is only one music. There's only one note. There's only one voice, which is um, development as part of a commercial machinery. So, while I would say that doesn't necessarily cover all cities, and certainly I, I would say there is still, in European cities, the framework of a, of a sort of public structure, and certainly an ambition towards the public realm, and an idea about what the city should look like. And that's what I think is very interesting in Berlin. I think this, the citizens of Berlin still have an idea of the shape of their city, what they expect their city to look like. So when Frank Geary comes along and does a tower in uh, Alexanderplatz, which I think, by the way, is not such a bad tower, everybody is frightened because it's not how they think a city looks. <laughs>
And Berlin is quite, I think, un unique that way. But I think to answer your, your go back to your question in the, more precisely, we <coughs> are forced as architects, unfortunately, to, or at least the opportunities within the autonomous architectural act uh, are less and less towards contributing towards an idea of the city. They become uh, not much more than an opportunity. So within that opportunity, you of course try to think whether you might uh, reinforce or create something beyond the building, some idea of what the city should be like, what society should be like. Is this analysis, oh, I said that. Diese Analyse, die Sie vornehmen, ist das ein Grund, warum Sie so viele Museen bauen und nicht andere Orte? Is the analysis that you're just uh, presenting the reason why you're building so many museums rather than other buildings? Museums are safe ground. It's a, it's a, uh, <laughs> because the museum is by definition already a, a sort of public place. So, and also, a museum is a commission that's, that comes with its own, if you like, benevolence and, and vision. Because whoever is building the museum, whoever is funding the museum, whoever is supporting the museum, by definition, is wanting to make a gesture, a collective gesture. We can't build cities out of museums. We have to build it out of housing, and, and I think this is a question back to your observation about Kant. Housing and offices and the, the normal architecture is what we need to build cities out of. But actually, that's becoming less and less of the territory of architecture. If you look in the, in the, the monographs of architects, the stars, it's railway stations, opera houses, museums, the, the single moments, the glamorous moments. But we can't see architecture only as a destination. You know, have you seen the latest opera house by Zahar Hadid? Or, um, so, uh, würden Sie sagen, das, was Sie bauen, im Wesentlichen, nämlich uh, Kultur, Kulturinstitutionen, Museen zum Beispiel, damit bauen Sie Inseln in der Stadt? So, would you say that what you're building, cultural institutions like museums, is basically building islands in the city? Well, I, th <clears throat> I think every, every attempt to make a sort of uh, a piece of architecture, I mean, first of all, every, uh, any good piece of architecture helps, whatever its reason, you know. And therefore, if you have, um, uh, you know, if the conditions are good to make a good piece of architecture, it shouldn't make that piece of architecture less important. Uh, but I think the challenge that we have at the time when we are building more city than we've ever built, I presume, um, we seem to have less ability to coordinate and give vision to that idea. And the architect can, of course, try to make their individual effort. But how do we do that when we're seeing in, I mean, certainly we're seeing in London, you know, enormous constructions. I mean, enormous. And, and actually, I have to say, on a one-by-one -one basis, the quality is not so bad. The, the, the materiality of the buildings and the, the, the developers are spending more money on their products because it, it will earn more money. But it doesn't make a city. Mm. And I think that should be the question I think yeah. we should talk about. Vielleicht sollten wir damit zu Richard Sennett kommen. Um, Perhaps that brings us to, to Richard here. Uh, ich habe uh, in den 90er Jahren uh, in Karachi, Pakistan gelebt. In the 1990s I lived in Karachi, in Pakistan. Uh, Karachi hatte zu dem Zeitpunkt, also in den 90er Jahren, 10 Millionen Einwohner. At that time in the 1990s, Karachi had 10 million inhabitants. Als Pakistan unabhängig wurde im Jahr 1947, hatte es nur 140.000 Einwohner. 
And at the time of Pakistani independence in 1947, the inhabitants were just 140,000. Wir sind jetzt ungefähr bei 15 Millionen, also eine permanent wachsende Stadt. So currently we reach something like 15 million, so it's a, it's a permanently growing city. Mit solchen Phänomenen, dass Nomaden, die mit ihren Ziegen und Schafen sozusagen umhergezogen sind im Sind, also im südlichen Pakistan, in Häuser zogen und in den Häusern sozusagen mit ihren Tieren zusammenlebten. So, it's a long time of development from when we had nomads living with their goats and sheep in, uh, in Sindh province, southern Pakistan, and then moving into houses where they cohabited with these uh, sheep and goats. Das ist sicherlich jetzt ein extremes Beispiel von Stadtentwicklung in den letzten Jahrzehnten. Ich möchte Sie fragen, Richard Sennett, könnten Sie aus Ihrer Beschäftigung mit der Stadt einmal einfach verschiedene Typen von Stadt, David Chipperfield hat es ja schon angedeutet, was es sozusagen aus Architekten sich bedeutet, entwickeln, auf deren Grundlage dann wir unsere Diskussion weiterführen können. So obviously this is a rather extreme case of uh, an urban development we've seen taking place in recent decades. But now you, Richard Senate, um, could you perhaps give us some different types of cities? I mean, David Chipperfield given us the, the architect's angle on cities, but perhaps you could categorize different types which we can use as a basis for our discussion. Well, could, I answer, oh, could I answer a different question? <laughs> Uh, okay, okay. Uh, 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 I want to just say as a, uh, a preface, because I want to talk about what, what I think urban d design is about, David, which is not architecture and where those two might meet. But I'd like to preface that by making to all of you an observation about the project that Alexander Kluge uh, is involved in. The use of the word, I don't know in German, but the use of the word civilization in English is very provocative. Uh, civilization means to us in English uh, something that is a kind of patina, a kind of uh, very class inflected. Uh, it's. Um, it's a word that contrasts unfavorably with the word culture, which in, in, includes anthropological uh, ways of uh, beliefs and, and practices and so on. And, oh, I'm sorry. Um, so that the notion that we might try and reconstitute a notion of civilization, which is not a, a, a gloss on everyday life, which, you know, civilization was a word that Rousseau, for instance, appall, uh, abhorred, that civilization was, it was a repressive concept. And I think one of the amazing things about Alexander Kluge's project is to try a way, in a way, to find something that is not just anthropological, but that adds this element of civilizing um, that is neither the kind of self-repression that Norbert Elias talked about when he wrote about the civilizing process, but to find something deeper. Uh, and it's to me a very provocative project in the three things that it puts together. The, the part of it is about capitalism, but it's beneath that about exchange as a civilizing process. Part of it is about um, religion, but beneath that it's monotheistic religion. And part of it, of course, which, as you've just seen, is, is the city. And the provocation is what do cities have to do with monotheism and have to do with capitalist forms of exchange? It's a very provocative trio 
of assumptions. Particularly, I would think, and maybe at the end of these three days we can talk more about it, the association of monotheism with civilization. It's a very unpagan notion. If you are Hindu, uh, you are a, Shint, a believer in Shinto, and forms of Buddhism, uh, this would seem, the notion of, of monotheism would seem uncivilizing because it forces uh, uh, religion into the mold of one God. So this is a very provocative association. Uh, and what does monotheism have to do with capitalism? So to me, the, this project is an amazing project, but it's also puzzling. I'm puzzled and I look forward to talking with you as much as we can uh, about what these three things, what these three subjects have to do with each other. Now, about cities, <laughs> um, you know, you can shut me up at any... No, 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 uh, no, no, at no, no. Any um, now you answer my question. <laughs> now I'm going to answer your question. I mean, I think the growth of the kinds of cities you're talking about puts, uh, puts in play three essential aspects of urbanism. And these are compression, porosity, and incompleteness. When you build an environment so that different groups uh, have a porous relationship to each other. That is, so that you don't have a, um, a highway of, of cars function like a wall, but that people can actually physically uh, uh, get to each other. You have uh, dealt with a fundamental condition of urbanism that runs against what's happening with the growth in numbers of cities like this, which is they're more disaggregated. That is, they're more walled in, they're bigger, but they're more isolated from each other. Uh, the phenomenon of concentration is related to that. A favela, or a barrio, or the kinds of places I was in in Shanghai, are low-density places. We always think of poor places as concentrated with people. But the truth is that the spread out of a modern city is the impoverishment of large areas of it is associated with depopulation. Uh, a big example of this for those of you uh, who have ever traveled there in the West, would be Harlem, which the poorer it got, the fewer people who could manage to live there. And so um, there's a way in which um, the growth of a city from 157,000 to 15 million also means that things are spread out that this essential quality of urban life, which is the concentration of different activities, different people, uh, is broken. And that's another way, since I am a critic of capitalism, <laughs> that is another, I mean, the capitalist system works often uh, to reduce concentration rather than increase it. And the third element I would say about these cities, and this is where I, I would come to you, David, with a question, is that when you have a big city filled, those 15 million people are mostly poor, filled with poor people, um, what are the physical conditions which allow the city to evolve and grow?
Uh, the construction of closed buildings, buildings that have a neat fit between form and function, builds in a kind of obsolescence. If let's imagine in 10 years that we decided that the Neues Museum uh, would become a school, how would we build it now or rebuild it now with the idea that it might be another kind of building? I, I raise this also about, you know, you show these, these towers in, uh, in Babylonia. But the history of those ziggurat forms is that they were enormously flexible. They could be many different things. A temple could be a place for people as well as the gods to live. It could be a market. Um, and it seems to me the problem with urbanism today is part of the problem is that our architectural ideas about what a building is are that its form and its function are tight together. And this is a way to make cities, particularly cities, filled with poor people who can't afford to rebuild, to paralyze them. Should David answer? I, th I think it would be good if David reacts on this issue. Hmm. Yeah. <coughs> I mean, Could you imagine the Neues Museum becoming a school? Yes, but I don't think, I'm not sure that's the issue. I understand completely, and I completely agree that the mantra of form following function uh, was, was a, a blind alley in architecture. And I, and I think that, um, you know, good buildings and good spaces and and uh, good cities survive. No one knocks down good architecture. No one, anymore, no one knocks down uh, good cities. Um, and in London, the cliche example always is, you know, Georgian architecture was very much developer architecture. It was highly flexible. Uh, the, the typical London house has been through so many different iterations, it's, it's very flexible, and I think that's completely true. But I think there's an issue of scale, and I think that's the thing that we have to think about. And what I was trying to say at the beginning, if you take the favela, I mean, if you, if you go into any of the favela, to be honest, in, in its intimacy, it's not so bad. You know? I mean, in terms of the physical in, environment, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a density and an intense a social density, but as we know, um, human beings are rather capable at dealing with those proximities. You know, unbelievably agile at being. I'm not, I'm not advertising it as a solution. The favela is a solution, but if you take that very organic type of um, intuitive growth, direct growth, which is absolutely connected to our impulse. So, also in Naples, you know, you see someone's built a balcony on their, ha on their house. They've added something and then they've done something else. They've improvised. Right. Actually, it, has, it means that that person has a control over their environment that most people don't have. So there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's very anarchic, it's very intimate, and it's a mess, okay. But it has a quality. Now, it's very dangerous to say these things because if you're in a favela, you say, oh, look, but look, you know, the life is, you know, they have a really rich life and it's very social. And of course, <clears throat> I'm not sure I would want to promote this as a, as, a, as a place to live. But I would know how to improve it physically. I'd know how one might make that place better. Similarly, I think what's interesting is that when you see, I mean, okay, that's one cliche. The other cliche is the post-war housing projects never worked 
because they were too dense, the land between the buildings never belonged to anybody, um, there's no real definition of public and private. But I have to say... The, that, uh, may I interrupt? What would you define as good architecture? Because you're saying good architecture will survive. What do you mean with good architecture? Um, something that has a physical presence that um, uh, is part of making a place that, that you are happy to be in that thing or be next to that thing. I mean, it's a, it's a complex, I mean, I can't answer it in one question because, you know, sometimes our experience of a building is being in it and sometimes it's by going past every day in a taxi. So, you know, good architecture. But I would so it's not just about the physicality of this place? I don't know. Um, just? I'm, I'm but I, I think, I, I think there are moments where the, the performance of a particular building doesn't have to be spectacular. You know, and I think we've spectacularized architecture. We expect something out of it. It, it. I mean, let's be clear. Most discussion about modern architecture now is about one percent. You know, it's it's about the the monuments that are being built, the opera house in in uh, one Chinese city or a museum or another. We are not talking enough about. You know, I mean, in the media, I'm saying. I mean, in a way, it's taking too much of our attention, and it's as if we've become uh, nearly incapable of giving order and collective decisions. I mean, in London, the, the one moment that London somehow organized itself across political boundaries, across, across um, planning boundaries, across uh, private and public investment, was organizing the Olympic Games two years ago. All of a sudden, when we have an event, we sort of be we, we perform like a society. Yeah. But you would never get those decisions made. I mean, we can't just wait for Olympics every time. <laughs> we should be able to give vision to our, to our city without that sort of crisis. And that's what I was trying to say is that, you know, I think we, we have on the one hand a very, you know, there's it's a potentially picturesque and charming um, quality of the, of the organic because it's very close to us. It's architecture or city made very directly. We have some physical hold on it. If you want to cover your balcony and you've sort of covered it in. At the very other end, I think there's architectural vision. Now, whether that's the Corbusian uh, or it's the Hansa Viertel in, in uh, Berlin, which, by the way, I think is a fantastic um, example of how that period of architecture and planning can work. But what we have now, I would keep referring to as a sort of convenient planning, because it, it allows investment to happen, it allows traffic to happen, it allows all the other considerations to have the upper hand. But there is no voice in that. So I'm, maybe I'm talking about the Anglo-Saxon condition more than the European, but I think it's, you know, it's coming here. Um, uh, that investment uh, wants convenience. It wants tidy edges. It wants this type of housing here and that type of housing. It doesn't even want mixed social typologies. Rich housing in the center of London, they do not want to build a, a, mixed, a social mixture. They want to say, okay, if we have to do it, we'll do it somewhere else. Yeah. And I think that's really changing our cities. And I think that's why Berlin is interesting because it does have accident. It does have, you know, in the street I live in, there's a Plattenbaum at one end and there's a, you know, a fancy restaurant at the other end. And this works in the texture of the city. And I think that's really... Alexander Kluge. Mm -hmm. uh, 
es gibt sozusagen glückliche Fälle ja, von Intimität und Öffentlichkeit, äh, wo sie nah beieinander liegen für Menschen. Es gibt einen Film zum Beispiel Menschen im Hotel. There are some lucky cases of intimacy and publicity in close proximity for people, publicness, if you like, yeah. And, uh, okay. Um, was? Es gibt einen Film, der yeah. heißt uh, Menschen im Hotel. And there is a film called People in the Hotel. Und der ist handlungsstark. And this is very strong on action. Wenn man die Tür zumacht, ist Intimität möglich. Because as soon as you close the door, intimacy becomes possible. Geht man aus der Hotelzimmer raus, ist sofort Öffentlichkeit vorhanden. But you have reached out to whatever public sphere immediately you leave the door. Dass man weiß, in so vielen anderen Hotelzimmern gehen Intimitäten vor, die interessant sind. You know, das stimuliert das Hirn und die Sinne. <lacht> In other hotel rooms, there are lots of intimacies going on that may be very fascinating, stimulating the brain and the senses. Um, so ist im Grunde, wie dieses Hotel, ja, ist eigentlich äh, Paris als Hauptstadt des 19. Jahrhunderts, wie Walter Benjamin das nennt, einmal gebaut gewesen. And functionally like this hotel, that's the way that Paris Uh, the, the 19th century capital, as Walter Benjamin once called it, that's how Paris was built. Voller Liebesgeschichten. Full of love stories. Napoleon na macht das zynisch. Napoleon did this in a cynical vein. Nach den ungeheuren Verlusten in der Schlacht von Borodino sagt er, After the devastating losses of the Battle of Borodino, in einer Meine Nacht in diesem gut gebauten Architektur von Paris, ja, sind die Kinder alle wieder da. He says, after just one night in this beautiful architecture of the city of Paris, all the kids will come again. Das ist zynisch, aber wahr. Cynical, but true. Ja. Und so gibt es meinetwegen eine Stadt, die mich sehr äh, mit äh, Gegenwart erfüllt, mit Wahrnehmungen erfüllt aus der Gegenwart. Das ist Lemberg. And there is also a city that fills me with perceptions of the present, and that is Lemberg. Das ist der Westen der Ukraine. Right in the west of Ukraine. Und sehen Sie, das nannte man 1912 das Paris des Ostens. And in 1912, people called it the Paris of the East. Und tatsächlich kommen dort aus der Provinz die Menschen nach Lemberg, um den Abspruch zu gewinnen bis Amerika. And actually, people from all over the provinces go to that city of Lemberg in order to make the jump over to the U.S. Das ist sehr städtisch. It's ja. very urban. Und sehen Sie, der Chef der New Yorker Taxifahrer, ja, unter Roosevelt, der kam aus Lemberg. <lacht> <lacht> and the boss of New York, wait for that, and the boss of New York cabs back at the time of Roosevelt came from Lemberg. Und in Hollywood können Sie auszählen, ja, die fähigen Produzenten und Regisseure, aus Lemberg. And in Hollywood, if you count those producers and directors that were really good at something, they were all from Lemberg. Das ist eine glückliche K-Stadt gewesen bis 1914. So until 1914, it was a very happy city of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Danach ist sie besetzt und umkämpft. After that, it was occupied and, and people were battling for it. Dann hat man, als die Deutschen dort eindringen, Massenmord. And then the Germans invaded it and mass murder happened. 1945 had Roosevelt eine Kernidee in Yalta. And in 1945 on Yalta, Roosevelt had one core idea. Russland hätte Kompensationen fordern können von ihm, für diesen Preis hätte er sie gegeben. Russia could have demanded compensation for that price of Lemberg, he'd have paid it all. Er wollte, dass dieses Lemberg unabhängig wird wie Danzig oder wie Casablanca. He wanted Lam Lemberg to become independent, like Danzig, Gdansk, or Casablanca. Darüber ist er gestorben und es wurde nicht ausgeführt. Well, he died over that, and sadly, it didn't happen. Und jetzt haben sie diese lebendige Stadt, ja, mehrfach dezimiert in ihren Menschen, ja, haben sie wieder erneut an der Spitze der Unabhängigkeitsbewegung in der Ukraine. Ja. And now this lively city, decimated so many times, is yet again leading the independence movement in das Ukraine. Das ist weit unterhalb der Schwelle der Politik in Brüssel oder in Russland. That's far below the level of Brussels politics or Russian politics. 
Aber es ist das, was Stadt ist und was gute Architektur und gute Anlage sein kann. Denn die Wasserhähne sind noch so gut wie in der Kaukau-Monarchie, aber nur in Lemberg. <lacht> And that is what makes a city, and that's also what makes architecture. And I'll tell you for why, because the taps they still have, they're just as good as they were at the time of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Das war ein Vortrag von Herrn Kluge, der uns allen gut gefallen hat. Und wir haben zwei es Sachen, in der, wir haben zwei Sachen. Es gemacht. war in der Länge nein, nein, absolut. eine Frage. <lacht> <So>. <lacht> Ja die, ja, die zwei Kernthesen waren ähm, die, äh, die, also die Differenzierung städtischen Lebens und äh, am Beispiel der Liebe und äh, die Stadt Lemberg als wundervolle Stadt. Die Frage, die sich daraus an Richard Sennett ergibt, ist, was interessiert ihn sozusagen an der Vielfältigkeit des Lebens in den Städten? Wie geht er damit um? Und vielleicht kann er ein städtisches Beispiel geben, was ihn fasziniert. So after all this, a presentation, no, in the length of it, actually a question. We had Alexander Kluge talk about two main aspects, namely urban life, exemplified by love, and the city of Lemberg, wonderful place. So the question to uh, Richard Sennett now is, what is it that he would see is so wonderful about the diversity of life in a city, and perhaps he can give us an example of a city he thinks is just as wonderful. Oh, it's Lemberg. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm not going to answer that question, uh, but I'll answer a question you should have asked me, uh, which is this, which is, um, what do we actually, uh, why is it that um, experiencing uh, conflict uh, in a city which arises from difference. Why is that something we should allow or, um, or even seek out? And um, it's something I've pondered a lot and I've been very influenced um, by uh, uh, an anthropologist and psychologist uh, named Gregory Bateson. Uh, who wrote a lot about the relationship between experiencing resistance and conflict and developing what he called focal attention. And there is a, and he in turn was somebody very much influenced by late Freud. And the answer he gives is this, that there is no pleasure really in thinking about serious forms of mixture of differences, of people or differences of function. But then we're faced with something that is difficult or that is resistant, uh, that we are stimulated, and he'd say even in your example, phys uh, in our brains, in a way that pleasure is not mentally stimulating. And the big question for him was, uh, in other words, he believed that cognition and frustration went hand in hand. And the big question for him was, well, how much of that can people tolerate? Mm -hmm. um, I give you a practical example of why this matters. Uh, Saskia and I have a colleague named Robert Putnam, and he's a friend who has argued that the only way you're going to get racial tolerance in a city is by separating the races physically. So that people can see the image of the other without ever having a visceral experience or visceral conflict. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Blacks live here, whites live over here. It's very easy to be a liberal, right? Because you never see a black. Uh, and Putnam argues that the liberal state, you know, uh, requires uh, a reduction, it requires physical separation to reduce this cognitive dissonance and uh, the feeling of uncomfort 
for me, that's a terrible recipe because it's the reign of the pleasure principle in, uh, in such a way that people are both physically separated and they're destimulated, that they lose something. So I think one of the things that happens when uh, people live in this condition of complexity uh, it's not that they make more love together, but that they, uh, they develop uh, what psychologists like this call focal attention. You pay attention to things that are difficult. Uh, and I think there's an argument that could be made, going back to the brain stuff in the beginning of your film, that the reason that the city has something to do with mental life, literally, is that, that there are forms of complexity, physical complexity, which are mentally stimulating. And you know, this is not an original thought to me. This was the idea of Zimmel when he wrote exactly. about the culture of great cities. That this... Uh, Please explain one moment who is Zimmel, yeah? Zimmel, he's a very, Georg very Zimmel, important philosopher yeah. from, uh, but doesn't live anymore. You see? Uh, yeah. yeah. Sorry. But should explain it a bit. He's very good, and you all should read him. Yeah. I'm sure you all have, but in case you haven't, just if this dropped through your your education, he was a a. a German Jewish philosopher who lived at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and his, a lot of his model of what uh, the city was about was a deduction about the experience of Potsdamer Platz, when Potsdamer Platz was a noisy, dirty, mixed, somewhat anarchic place. And for him, that kind of, it, he said, this is a place that develops a kind of rationality. Yeah. Because you have to think about what's happening. Somebody suddenly grabs you t to beg, or you're afraid that you're going to be attacked, that you're mentally alert. Whereas in um, the suburbs, uh, there's no thought as required. Uh, Richard, uh, bei Simmel, was auch zentral ist, ist, dass er sagt, in den Städten werden die Beziehungen zwischen den Menschen immer abstrakter und darin sieht er einen Vorteil, sozusagen. Um, one of the central ideas in Simmel is also that he says, in a city, relations between people get increasingly abstract and he sees this also as an advantage. Because, uh, weil sie dann besser mit Komplexität uh, arbeiten können. Because it enables them to cope with complexity better. Well, that's not entirely correct, what can you, you say. Yeah, can you, can you, the, Zimmel assumes, and it's a very powerful concept when you think about it, he, uh, what he calls a mask of rationality. That is, faced when you're psychologically overstimulated, one thing you do is you adopt a very neutral cool. You're cool in the city. You don't show your feelings to other people. You don't make yourself vulnerable. But it's not that you've been neutralized. Behind there, you are seething. Uh, you're, you're aware. And I think this is one thing uh, that has, when we talk about organic form in the city, about being comfortable, you know, about things, if that's what you mean by organic. I mean, how does the, the mic. I mean, how does the city get built? Ah, he is the experience, he's concerned with the erlebnis of it, with how it's experienced. Because I'd, I'd like to come back to the idea of, you know, what should a city look like? Yeah. And what the physicality of a city mm -hmm. is. And are we, should we still be wor worrying about 
making a beautiful city. I mean, it, it seems like we can't. Do you um, really believe that? Well, I don't see, you know, in new cities, in, in new um, idea, you know, whether this is Shanghai or, or Doha or whatever, I'm sorry, they, they look like something, but they're not beautiful cities. Right. So, now, am I disappointed because I have an idea of what a beautiful city should be, and we are unrealistic to imagine that we can control the form of cities anymore. I mean, can we anymore have a picture in our mind of what a city should look like, or are we just carrying around an image in our minds about what cities used to look like, whether that's, you know, Vienna or Paris or, you know, we go to, you know, tourists go to Venice or they go to historic cities to, in a way, indulge themselves in the satisfaction of this is a beautiful city. Now, given, well, we given that lots, we... We have lots of aesthetic experience, which is not a beauty. Yes, but we have a picture. I mean, what's interesting for me in Berlin is that the Berliners have a strong opinion about what their city should look like. Ah. If Frank Gehry came and did a tower in London, no one would notice. Right. I mean, it, it's just one more tower. <laughs> but for this city, it, you know, to do a tower in Alexanderplatz, it's a new, a commercial tower. This city's not used to that, really. And it's not, I don't think there's anything wrong with the architecture, and I think this goes back, you know, because I think, I would have to say, Cities are much more interesting than architecture. You know, cities can become part of our, uh, architecture can become part of cities. And how wonderful is it when architecture and city comes together in some rich way? I think Milan or Stockholm or places like that where you see a certain integrity of the city itself and yet it has diverse periods of architecture and yet it holds together. But I think what, what my concern is, as an architect, trying to work in cities is a sort of continuous frustration that we are struggling with what we think a city might be, and yet we seem to be going further and further away from our ability to deal with it. And yet we haven't given up our picture of it. So, is it that in a hundred years' time, you know, another Richard Senate will be looking back on Doha and saying, what an amazing construction, you know, what an extraordinary civilization produced this. <laughs> he doesn't believe it. And, and I want, to, I have to be careful that, you know, I don't say anything too much against Doha where I'm actually working, but uh -huh. one, one, I'm not doing a tower. But... <laughs> What's interesting is that this thing now looks like a city. In the last 10 years, Doha has become a city. From one kilometer, it's a city. But when you're in it, you don't know you're in it. Yeah. Because on the ground, it disappears. The closer you get to it, the further right. it goes right. away. Yes. Yes. We don't, we seem to know what, we've, we've got a new idea of a city, which is a silhouette but we don't know how to make it on the ground. And London now, we just no. finish this, that no. London is now woken up. I mean, in, in, uh, in one of Alexander Kluger's film, you're gonna see the, the, the idea of the boiled frog, which I never knew about, but I think it's a fantastic idea. Um, that his, I shouldn't be giving it away, should I? But I think everybody knows the, 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 frog, the boiled frog syndrome. That, if you throw uh, a frog into boiling water, it will jump out. But if you put a, a frog in cold water and turn the heat up, it won't, it won't escape because it won't realize, there won't be any particular moment when it realizes it's too hot and it's too late. It feels happy till it's Until it's too late. He's dead. Yeah. So in London, we are boiled frogs because finally we will have 250 towers built within the next five years. And now 
there's a, a big discussion because now finally, unlike the people in Berlin who are continuously questioning why something is happening here, why something is that, you know, you have four newspapers, so you're continuously arguing about what should happen in the Kultur Forum, what should happen with the Schloss, what should happen with Alexanderplatz, what should happen with Potsdam. I mean, this, what's interesting is that I think Berlin has an articulated sense of itself, and that's a very unusual thing. London, it just happens, because we're merchants. We think, well, we have towers because towers bring money, and money makes the city, and we've been told that. Now everyone's woken up as boiled frogs and said, oh my God, our city looks like that. <laughs> my God, we never, when did that happen? <laughs> A last question to uh, Richard Senne. Um, diese Idee, dass wir ein Bild im Kopf haben der Stadt, wie verhält sich das zu deinem Ansatz der Open City, also einer, einer Stadt, die immer im Prozess ist? Uh, the idea, the image of the city that we have in our minds, how does that relate to your idea of the Open City, the city permanently undergoing a process? Uh, well, that isn't exactly my idea. Uh, I mean, I, uh, uh, the last uh, four or five years, of, uh, I've been thinking about what open systems theory uh, would mean about understanding urban form. And I got very interested in this from learning about Linux programs and so on. And the whole idea of an open system is of a form that's self-revising. It's not an endless process. A city that were, was an endless process of, uh, of creative destruction, you know, where you, things were, nothing was valued, everything was in process of being taken down or built up would be a place that nobody loved, uh, that nobody uh, had experienced anything in. The whole idea of an open system is that it's a, do you say in German an Eberbrücken, a rough passage uh, between form and process. Mm -hmm. And that's built into open systems architecture in computing. And I got very interested in how that same architecture is physically built. This. Eberbrücken, would you say? Rough passage uh, between form and process. So what I'm interested in is what happens uh, as people's ways of living gestate forms which then become superseded by new ways of living. How, how do the forms either adapt or resist so what is changing. Do we really change our way of living? Mike. Do we really change our way of living? I mean, we don't, we, we don't change oh, I think we that do. much. We not don't live not individually. You think so? I don't. I, I have think a, that... Have a bathroom, have a kitchen, have a yeah, living room. Yeah, but I mean, if you, you were... <laughs> I mean, that's been going on for quite a long while. Yes, but if you were living a hundred years ago... <laughs> no, you had a bathroom, yeah, you just had a Well, different. you wouldn't, but I mean... <laughs> Um, you don't think there's any history? No, I, I just, I think it's, I think that we talk in architecture, we're always talking about change, and change becomes an excuse for why we do things differently. But our fundamental requirements are not much different. We are, we are, we are social animals. We want to be, as Alexander says, we want to be private. We want architecture to protect us to stop rain coming on our heads, keep us warm and stop the wind. <laughs> Once we've done that, we want to open some holes because we want to look out and see, you know, is there somebody else doing the same? <laughs> and then we want that thing to be part of many others. So we then feel that we protect, architecture protects us and we can close the window, but at the same time, it can bring us in dialogue with others. So what we want from architecture is protection and participation.
That's why we sit in restaurants paying an enormous amount of food to eat at a table and never to talk to anybody else in the restaurant. Uh, at, at, the, the plate of food costs us 10 times more than it would cost if we, we did it at home. And we, we sit in a room with 80 people that we never talk to. So it's the same idea that we want to be uh, privately um, privileged in some way, but yet we insist, and I think this is the most fascinating thing about the city, we insist to be part of something else. We build our walls and then we want them to be open again. Ich möchte das mal Ich möchte hier eine kurze Geschichte erzählen, die äh, von ähm, ihrer Frau Saskia Sassen äh, mir erzählt wurde und ich habe sie literarisch inzwischen einmal verewigt. So I'd like to take this moment to tell you a brief story that your wife Saskia Sassen told me once and I've now put it into a sort of literary form forever. Da ist ein völlig unpraktisches Hochhaus in New York. In New York there is this completely impractical high rise. Im 40. 40. Stock ist ein Bank, äh, eine Bank untergebracht und ein Youngster, ein junger Mensch, ja, äh, bedient dort die Computer. On the 40th floor you've got a bank and there's a young guy operating a computer. Er könnte ganz Westafrika die Kredite wegnehmen. He could take the, all the loans away from West Africa. Ein machtvoller Mensch. A man with a lot of power. Aber mittags hat er plötzlich Hunger. Die Natur revoltiert. But at lunchtime, he feels hungry. Nature revolts. Mit den Fahrstühlen fährt dieser Westmensch runter äh, die 40 Stocke und kommt jetzt, so hat es mir Saskia Sassen erzählt, ja, unten an auf der Straße. And um, goes down by lift, all these 40 floors down, and as Saskia told me, ends up at street level. Da sind kleine äh, Buden, äh, wo ein Mädchen zum Beispiel aus Bangladesch Nahrung verkauft. There are all these little stalls where, for example, there's a, a Bangladeshi girl selling food. Da geht er hin und nähert sich. He goes there and feeds himself. Jetzt kann es sein, dass er wieder hochfährt und den Mist, den er sonst macht, da oben weiter betreibt. Now maybe he just goes back up and continues with the same rubbish he's done all the time. Er könnte sich aber auch verlieben. But he might fall in love. Der Prinz und die Schäferin. Like the prince and the little shepherdess. Und äh, im zweiten Fall hätten sie jetzt Romeo und Julia in New York. And if it were the second case, you'd have Romeo and Juliet in New York. Was ich damit sagen will, ist, dass eine ganz starke Macht bei Menschen liegt, die sich auch unpassende Städte und unpassende Gebäude aneignen. What I want to say with this is that there is this very, very strong force within people that makes very unsuitable places and cities their very own. Und das ist ein Element von dem, was Richard Sennett Open City nennt. And this is one aspect of what Richard Sennett calls yeah. Open City. Und wofür Sie bauen. And that's what you built for. <laughs> Ja, ich möchte jetzt unsere beiden Discussants, äh, Eva Blau und Philipp Eckert, einladen, ein kurzes Statement zu geben. So now we ask for a brief statement from um, the, the two people, Eva Blau und Philipp Eckert. Vielleicht ganz kurz, Eva Blau ist Assistenzprofessorin für Stadtgestaltung an der Harvard University. Um, Eva is an assistant professor at Harvard University for Urban uh, Design. Well, um, I'm going to speak Uh, my responses are uh, coming from a perspective which is of, uh, I'm a historian um, of architecture and of urban design. And there are two things that came out of this that I think are really um, interesting and, and, well, the whole thing is fascinating, but that reminded me of certain things. And one of them uh, was a project of the 1950s which was called the New Babylon. And I don't know if you know about this, but all architects do. And it was an ongoing project by a, uh, a Dutch artist, Constant Nurenhees. I'm probably spelling, uh, pronouncing it wrong. Um, and it was a pro polemical provocation. It was a critique of the city and of social structures. 
And it was especially a uh, critique of the perceived failure of modernist planning. And it was an idea, and this is where it touches on what, what uh, uh, Richard is, is interested in and working on. It was, it was an attempt to rethink the city as an open system um, and to create an order that was, and this is the way it was conceived at the time, that was not the kind that was generated by economic imperatives alone. Uh, and it was not the kind of city that was imagined uh, by modern planning, but that was, in fact, uh, architectural in imagining new social, spatial uh, forms in terms of the relationship between the social and the spatial. And it was a similar idea, I think, as the open city to resolve conflicts between design and spontaneity, between the large and the small scale, uh, between the permanent and the transient, uh, and also to bring together diversity and coherence. And the interesting thing about this, this new Babylon is that the form it took was basically of a tower turned on its side. Um, it was a large space frame structure that was perceived as continually growing. It was an idea, it was never built. Um, and it was flexible, so there was this big structure and inside it were flexible pieces uh, of private and public space. Um, and the idea, it was hovering over the world and the idea was that it would eventually cover the planet. Um, now this idea gave, uh, was an inspiration for megastructure, which many of you are probably familiar with in the 1960s. And megastructure was one of the great creative uh, failures of architecture, and it was abandoned. Uh, it was an idea to, to put the functions of the city, to deal with them in terms of architecture, to create a structure for them. And uh, megastructure failed because um, what were created were objects and that these objects didn't sort of plug into other things. But there was another reason too, and I think that this is something that we can talk about over the next days, is that architecture is actually not itself an open system. And that architecture, the materiality and the specificity of architecture play against that. That it, it never can fully operate as an open system, but it's extremely important uh, it plays an extremely important role in the urban. And what's interesting about megastructure and this, this example that I'm talking about is that the impulse here is to combine and balance the formal and the informal, and the static and the kinetic in the city. And that, I think, remains a very important issue. And it's interesting, you may also be familiar with Rem Kohlhaas' uh, discussion of, of Lagos. Um, where he, at the end of that uh, film that he did, which uh, the name escapes me at the moment, he discovered that the city had been very carefully planned in the 1970s by actually uh, DDR planners, um, and that the informal formations that he loved, um, that they actually took place within that framework, not outside it, and most important, that they were sustained by that framework. And so this brings me back to this idea of the open city and these strategies that, um, that Richard has uh, developed for generating uh, urban, um, open urban systems and of ambiguity and of incompleteness and of irresolution and their strategies for uh, an open approach to planning. And, this makes me think of another one that I want to propose here, another kind of openness, um, which is uh, a concept of the open work. And this is a concept as, as the, the one I'm talking about is the one uh, conceived by Umberto Eco. And what I find useful and interesting in that concept of the open work is that, and this is where I'm coming from, uh, that it conceives a role for design and for architecture, and it also involves combining openness with internal coherence. And the open, the, the idea of the open work is that, the, 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 the concept of work is that it implies a project. It conceives of work as a project, as something that's dynamic, 
that's open-ended, but it is also purposeful. And so the idea of the city as an open work uh, is a concept of the city as a project. And what I find interesting in that is that it describes a, uh, a key role for the uh, design practices, actually, and that it's a, it's a project, really, of the design disciplines. And uh, in particular, though, not in terms of form or process for producing cities, but in terms of a very particular kind of knowledge and a particular kind of imagination that is architectural, that is socio-spatial kind of imagination. And I think that's very important for today, um, especially important because, as we know, what's happening today is that there are new actors determining the economic and spatial organization of cities. Uh, as we know also, multinational corporations are assuming roles that were previously played by government uh, and agencies of government. And it's important that architects not retreat from that and not retreat from, uh, and designers retreat from these processes over which, and, and maintain that they don't have control, um, but that they really bring this kind of design knowledge to city making. And the important thing, I think, also about the idea of the open work and the, the city as an open work is that it's not only about intervening in the city, but it's also about reading it, reading it as, as Richard does in terms of strategies to understand what those interventions do and often that takes a very long time um, because we don't know what they're going to do. It takes a long time for that to happen. And so I think that the point that this leads me to is that it's this legibility of the urban that is in many ways its own agency and that it allows the city to become a protagonist in its own making. Um, as, as someone else put it uh, today, I think, uh, both an archive and a field of experiment. And what's, uh, this relates to me, my last point here, um, that this relationship was articulated very clearly and powerfully uh, by Henri Lefebvre, the uh, French philosopher and sociologist, where he talked about how the urban forges a connection between information and form, that in the city, information becomes form that produces its own kind of knowledge. And I think that's a really interesting thing, and we've been talking about this, or you've been talking about this relationship uh, between form and content, form and function. And as, as Lefebvre put it, I think, again, really evocatively, that the urban is a spatial formation in which the logic of form is associated with the dialectic of content, and that they're in a permanent condition uh, in which form and content are mutable and dynamic, and they involve the formal and the informal, the static and the kinetic, that they're intricately bound together and mutually transforming and continually produce these spaces uh, of difference, uh, or as Lefebvre called it, actually, differential space. Um, Again, what Richard has been talking about. Thank you. Vielen Dank, Yves Blau. Ich bitte nun Philipp Eckhardt, arbeitet an der Freien Universität und ist gleichzeitig Chefredakteur der Zeitschrift Texte zur Kunst. To speak, um, He's editor-in-chief and his paper is also from Berlin's Free University. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm um, going to say a few words um, from the perspective of somebody who's lived in Berlin and who's lived in the city since the mid-1990s with interruptions and intermissions elsewhere. And I think what I have to say also relates more to uh, my current work as a critic than what I do as a scholar, although there are moments in it. I, I, I'm going to start by um, giving you a very short statement that interweaves, I believe, with segments of, uh, of, of the discussion and also with um, 
uh, elements um, that came up in Alexander Kluge's film tonight. Now I'd say that uh, since the 1990s, the once famous uh, proverbial vo voids of Berlin haven't just been nearly completely sealed, uh, closed, or filled up. The very figure of the Berlin void itself, and we've been talking about it in the figure of Potsdamer Platz, not as it existed at Simmel's time, but as it existed after the wall came down, and also the Potsdamer Platz that you brought up in the, in the interview that Piano was talking about. So the very figure of the Berlin void itself has also been recoded. These voids used to combine functional underdetermination, what can we do with all these seemingly empty zones in the middle of the city, and historical overdetermination. In their negativity, they embody the cities and this countries and even this continent's fraud history, the expropriation, expulsion, and extermination of its Jewish citizens, the destructions of World War II inflicted upon Europe by Germany and the subsequent political division uh, of this country and also um, of this continent into the two political systems that coexisted here. And all this was very visible in the 90s and also palpable and something that you could feel. In the city's history, there was a moment, perhaps, to quote Alexander Kloge, a moment between times, eine Lücke zwischen den Zeitaltern, in which these spaces became the site for uh, unprecedented types of activity and productivity. And I should add that the techno tracks with which Kluge accompanied, accompanied the time-lapse montage sequences in The Principle of the City, which you heard tonight, would have found their first publics in such reconverted voids here in Berlin, but often uh, in rundown and derelict buildings, either here or in Berlin's temporary uh, transatlantic twin city in ruins, namely Detroit, which is currently undergoing um, a very different phase than Berlin is in at the moment, as I imagine. Nowadays, these voids, or more accurately, their very last remainders, and perhaps not even these, perhaps we're already talking about the memory of these voids. Nowadays, these voids are being marketed as spatial occasions for the creative class which is, along with the tourists, supposed to reinvigorate the city with its businesses. In a classical first is tragedy, then as far scenario, the voids have been recoded into spaces of, of opportunity, still categorized by functional indeterminacy, but now geared toward market, marketability. They have become options, in fact. What we are facing is a vision, quote unquote vision, of the city as one vast project space. A condition perhaps most succinctly epitomized or symptomized, I'd say, in the utter failure to provide a conceptual pro programming for that hollow space which will be sitting behind the quote unquote reconstructed facade of the Stadtschloss, the city palace, a screen in fact, and that space will be a so-called agora, an agora, a space supposedly brought to life by a host of collaborations and open interactions with a so far yet to, to be determined protagonist. A fitting agra, I'd say, indeed, for what uh, Ciappello and Boltanski have called the project-based polis of new capitalism. I'm wondering if these conditions, and this is where I'm looking back to what, we were, what you were talking about earlier, now I'm wondering if these conditions prompt us to uh, reconsider our notions or differentiate our notions uh, of porosity, incompleteness, and openness that you so succinctly and so um, minutely uh, laid out in your work, um, where they, as I understand it, but correct me if I'm wrong, emerged within a critique of the failures of modernist urbanism. Um, I'm thinking here of a parallel maneuver that would be modeled on your differentiation of the notion of borders versus boundaries, and you're very clear that borders are not boundaries, and that the boundary zone is central to what you consider to be a functional city vis-a-vis -vis the border that performs a different function. And I'm wondering if we need a, a similar differentiation or a similar distinction, a dialectical critique of the notion of openness with which we are dealing today at this historical moment. And so wouldn't we need a similar critical reinvestigation of that concept, which might other, otherwise all too easily be hijacked by the proponents of a merely market-oriented idea of flexibilization. Um, now, I, I tried to think uh, of a question for, for David Chipperfield that would have related to the um, architectural vocabulary, uh, how it relates to history, but I'm just gonna skip that. And since you uh, um, mentioned that you thought that Berliners had a very clear idea of what that city should look like, I'd be very interested in hearing from you what, it, what, what that image of the city that you're feeling here might be. Because 
I seem to have a different experience. There are moments where I think it's working very nicely, but when I walk past Alexanderplatz, I'm not so sure if I understand. I don't, maybe, maybe you weren't referring to a positive vision, but more to what you later on described as a process of contestation, critique, and debate about architecture within the city. And with that, I'm going to leave it at that. Die Zeit ist jetzt leider schon sehr fortgeschritten und ich frage, gibt es eine ganz wichtige Frage aus dem Publikum? So, since time is running away with us, is there any absolutely urgent question? A real urgent. Okay, we take one. Do we have a mic there? Um, ich habe eine Frage von, äh, von Zenit, das zweite Mal ich ihn höre, einmal habe ich ihn äh, in der Städelin gehört. <lacht> Herr Zenit, ich habe 39 Horstverbot als Kunstwissenschaftlerin in Deutschland bekommen, weil ich eine Position vertrete, dass in der Politik, in Außenpolitik ganz eingesetzt wird. Das heißt, deutsche Staat und alle Kunsteinrichtungen um sich als Original zu verkaufen, geben mir Hausverbot als Hochschuldozentin und als jemand, der Kunstwissenschaft studiert hatte. Ist das städtisch? Ist das städtisch? Es geht, es geht, um, städtische, es, es geht um städtische Kultur. Auch Herr Alexander Kluge kennt mich sehr gut. Ist das städtisch, was, was, was hier geschieht? Ist diese Question, ist das noch eine Frage? Und was ist Ihre Definition von Zivilisation und Staat? Okay. Äh, Gibt es noch, gibt's noch weitere Fragen? <lacht> Dann hier, hier vorne ist noch eine Frage. Ja, ja, es gibt hier. Es gibt äh, hier noch eine Frage. She's saying that the chairman isn't suitable because he's yeah. not. I've got a question with regard to um, housing projects, um, since um, Mr. Chipperfield talked about that. So um, I think Richard Sennett has some um, very personal experience with regard to housing projects. So maybe um, we could talk a bit about how, how people can be brought together, because um, David Chipperfield said a bit about that. And uh, maybe you can give a comment on that. What what your opinion on housing hmm. projects is? Das ist aber eine Frage für den ganzen Vortrag. <lacht> äh, ich glaube, das wird sehr schwierig, hier diese Fragen zu beantworten. Äh, ja, und viele brechen auf. Also ich glaube, wir schließen an dieser Stelle. Die Fragen lassen wir im Raum stehen. Und ich wünsche Ihnen einen schönen Abend. We end it now. Have a nice evening.